Sometimes we forget that the four round metal things between us and the road are kind of important. After all, they carry us around and hardly ever complain. We owe it to them to pay attention to what they need once in a while. Hi, I'm Alan Peltier. I'm the president of HRE Performance Wheels. Uh, today we're going to have an episode of Drive Engineered where we're going to talk about the science and engineering of wheels. Uh, hopefully at the end uh, come away with an understanding of not just what goes into making wheels but also why and how that affects your car and why it's important. Most people know that a wheel should be lightweight. But why? First is unsprung mass. So the mass of the wheel, the tire, the brakes, parts of the suspension, that's called the unsprung mass. That's the, that's the mass of the vehicle that's not supported by the suspension. And you want that to be as light as possible because in a motorsport setting, you want to be able to have wheels hop over disturbances and require as little force to get them back to the asphalt. You don't want that wheel uh, up in the air, you want it on the ground. You know, you don't have any traction if the tire's not touching the ground. So if you have this big heavy wheel and it's spending all its time in the air and you have to really use a lot of force to get that back down, it's not going to be so great for handling. The other thing is all that mass, the higher the mass is, when it does hit a disturbance, it's going to put more force into the chassis. So because there's more force going in the chassis, you're going to upset the chassis versus that chassis sort of running straight and level. And the wheel, you can imagine a lightweight wheel is just going to sort of hop over things. A big heavy wheel is going to move the car more, right? So that's the effect of unsprung mass. And you can see on a wheel, in these areas, we're going to come in and we're going to take extra mass out where it's not needed to, to try and reduce that. The other aspect of mass is uh, rotational inertia. You can think of that as the rotational mass. And it's a function of how much mass is, or the distribution of that mass about the rotational axis. So the, the distribution of the mass about this center axis coming out here. And basically the way it works is the more mass you have that's farther away from that center, the more your rotational inertia. And a way to think of it is an ice skater. An ice skater has their arms out and they're spinning slowly. And without putting any more energy in, they pull their arms in and they spin faster. What they've done is they've re reduced their rotational inertia, allows them to spin faster. So on a wheel, we're not really able to make all of our wheels 15 inches in diameter. So we can't really pull our arms in. But what we can do is on a 20 inch wheel, we can sort of cut their hands off. And you'll see that sort of on a three piece wheel, we'll come in here and again, between the fastener holes where there's not a lot of stress, we'll take out some extra mass with some of the pocketing that we do. Or on our motorsport wheels that are three-piece, we'll add titanium fasteners instead of a stainless steel fastener to reduce that rotational inertia as well. Why is rotational inertia important? Um, again, there's two things, acceleration and deceleration. So if you are trying to accelerate in a sports car and you want to go quickly, if you have a lot of rotational inertia, it actually takes more energy to get the wheel going. And the more energy you're spending getting the wheel going, that means that's less energy to get the car going. And so it will reduce your acceleration if you have wheels with heavy, uh, a lot of rotational inertia. And on the flip side, under braking, if you have wheels with a lot of rotational inertia and you go to brake, it takes more energy to get those wheels stopped and then there's less energy reserved to get the car stopped. Generally, there are three types of ways to make a wheel. Uh, one is a cast wheel, one is a forged wheel, and one is sort of a combination is uh, what we call a cast flow form wheel. A cast wheel is, uh, you can think of as a traditional wheel. It's, uh, take molten aluminum, and you're gonna pour it into a mold, pretty much have what looks like a wheel. You're gonna pop it out of that mold, and you can do some final machining and clean that up, but the style and the barrel and everything is pretty much predetermined in that mold. With the forged wheel, you're going to start with 
uh, a cylinder billet. In our case, it's going to be 6061 in an O condition, and it's going to be about a 100-pound cylinder of aluminum. You're going to take that, and you're going to stick that in a huge forging press. And with a lot of heat and pressure, you're going to compress that uh, cylinder into a predetermined shape that's going to be called a forging. And what you're doing when you do that is you're not making it denser, because if you made the aluminum denser, you're going to make that heavier. And when you're putting all that energy into it, what you're doing is you're making that grain structure very, very fine. And that allows you to increase the strength and formability of that wheel in a way that you can't get with a cast. And so after you have that forging, it doesn't yet have the design and it doesn't have the barrel. It has a little bit of a skirt. And so we call it, it's a forged blank, basically. So what you're gonna do is, before you wanna cut this design into it, you need the barrel. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that barrel and you put it on another hydraulic machine. You're gonna spin that barrel out. It's almost like you, a, a potter's wheel with clay. It's where you have a potter's wheel and they're shaping a clay pot or something and it's spinning. You're doing the same thing. You're shaping that barrel out, except you're using it uh, you're doing it with aluminum. And so it's a lot of pressure and it ends up generating a lot of heat. But then what you end up having is what's a big forged spun blank and it looks like a big bucket. But it's still got a big solid face and that still weighs about 100 pounds. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take that and we're gonna put it on our lathe and we're gonna turn a very precise profile into that. So it's gonna be cut so the whole surface profile and you're still gonna have a big solid but it's gonna look very shiny and very pretty at that point. From there, we're gonna take it and stick it in a mill, and we're gonna start cutting out the window pattern. And that's where the style, you'll start to see the style really develop, and also that's where we're gonna to start to define it, define it for the vehicle. We're gonna put the lug holes in and all the cap detail and all of that. And it's gonna really look like a, a finished wheel, except it still has to go from there through final QC and prep, and then powder coat or paint or whatever it's gonna go through for finish. There's actually one method that's in between both of those, and that's what we call a cast flow form wheel. And we actually have one here. Um, and this, this wheel here is cast, has a cast face, so this face is predetermined. But instead of the barrel being cast in completely, uh, it's, it's cast with a skirt. So just like a forged wheel, after that wheel has been cast, then we have to put it on the flow form machine and and, and spin that barrel out. And that sort of gives us something that's sort of half forged and half cast. The, the center spokes and everything are cast, but you get that lightweight, high strength barrel like you do on a forged wheel. And that allows us to reduce what would be a typical cast cross section of a barrel, maybe five millimeters down to say three, much more similar to a forge. And so uh, a cast flow form wheel is a great uh, in-between So what's the advantage of a cast wheel or a forge wheel? Um, a cast wheel is easy to manufacture. Uh, the material's not as strong as a forge material. Um, and it also doesn't have the toughness of a forge wheel. So if you hit a pothole or something like that, um, it, it's not gonna absorb the energy as well. And, and that's an engineering term called toughness and that, that's how much elongation it has and it will tend to crack. Um, a forged wheel with a spun barrel has a lot of toughness and can absorb a lot of energy. So when you hit a pothole or something that's gonna bend before it uh, cracks, um, it also has a much higher strength. So we're able to uh, refine the design more and get more weight out of the design because the material itself is stronger. So for the same load rating on a forge wheel versus a cast wheel, the forge wheel is gonna be significantly lighter. There's a third wheel that's sort of in between those, and that's what we call a cast flow form wheel. And our flow form series is that. It's got a cast face, and so you still need to flow form that barrel out. The advantage of that, again, is you're gonna refine that crystalline structure of the aluminum and, and make that barrel much stronger than in a traditional cast wheel. And that allows us to use a, a thinner cross section, reduce the weight, and have better impact protection. So that's a cast flow form wheel. So that's sort of the best way to make a cast wheel. What are the differences between the different construction methodologies, uh, either a one-piece forged wheel, or a two-piece, or a three-piece? And first, it's best to explain what those are. And Atri is known for a three-piece wheel, which is like this. So this is where we generated our reputation 
And this we call it a three-piece wheel because it has a center forging, which is this main center section here. It has an outer rim barrel, and then it has an inner rim barrel. And these rim barrels are very similar to the way a flow-formed one-piece uh, rim is made, except these start with sheet. So imagine you have a big circular flat sheet and you're gonna put it on a mandrel and roll that over and spin it into the shape of a bucket and then do the final machining. And what you're doing again by spinning that sheet out is you're strengthening this barrel. The thing about a three-piece wheel is it's, it's literally bolted together. These are not decorative. These are either titanium or high strength stainless fasteners. And these hold these three pieces together and then we put a silicone seal here to hold the air in. The advantage of a three-piece wheel is it has a lot of flexibility in terms of fitment. These all vary in half-inch increments. And so if you've got something really custom or crazy, it's really easy for us to fit that inside the vehicle, especially if you've done a lot of modification. The other thing is you can do a lot of customization. So if you want to have different colors and different things, different rim color versus a center and stuff like that, that's obviously a lot easier compared to a one-piece wheel. I don't have a two-piece wheel to show you, so a two-piece wheel is the same, except a two-piece wheel has the center and then a solid one-piece barrel, and they're usually bolted or welded together. Um, a one-piece wheel is, looks like a cast wheel or a, or a forged wheel. They look very similar. Um, you can see it's all just one piece. Now, the advantage of a one-piece forged wheel is the constraints, there aren't the geometric constraints that you have of a three-piece wheel. Three-piece wheel, you have to have enough material when you're bolting these things together, so there's enough strength to keep that connection strong. Also, that connection gets in the way of brakes and other things like that, so that causes a constraint. Um, there's other design constraints, but just having that geometry that's required to put those pieces together. And also with the spun barrels, we don't have as much control to fine tune them uh, depending on the application. So for us, if we're doing something that's very lightweight motorsport or versus street or something like that. For a one, on a one-piece forge barrel, we have the ability to design this barrel however we want, and we can fine-tune it for the application. Whereas a three-piece, you're sort of going to over-design that barrel because you don't know what the application is going to be. And so it may end up being a little bit heavier or something, depending on the application. It probably helps to go into some of the engineering drivers and goals and constraints that we're working with when it comes to designing a wheel. A lot of people just assume, you know, you need to make it round and it needs to be pretty, or in some cases not so much, but uh, um, that's only one aspect of it. And depending on whether you're making a motorsport wheel, or for us a street performance wheel, or a luxury wheel, there's a set of goals and constraints and, and targets, and they're gonna shift along as we start to design different things. And so obviously the priorities for a luxury wheel are gonna be different than priorities for a motorsport wheel. So with a motorsport wheel, you're gonna to wanna to have high strength, low weight, low rotational inertia, and high stiffness. When you go to a street performance wheel, you have those same constraints, strength, lightweight, you wanna reduce the rotational inertia still, you wanna have high stiffness, and you have to, at that point, add in the style component. The style has to be gorgeous. And uh, so all of those things have to balance out on the street performance wheel. When you move toward luxury, it becomes much more a driver of strength and style. Uh, the low weight, usually luxury wheels are so heavy that uh, a forged luxury wheel is already going to be significantly lighter. So our focus on the weight isn't as critical as it is for a motorsport wheel. And then so style and strength starts to take over. So you're going to put this on a Bentley or you're going to put it on a Cayenne or something like that. And strength becomes much more important, the load ratings are much higher for a luxury wheel than they are for a normal street performance wheel that you're gonna put on a Ferrari or a Porsche or something like that. If you're looking to buy aftermarket wheels, um, you do need to be very cautious because particularly in the United States, um, there's not a lot of regulation around uh, wheels. There's, not, there's no testing required. Uh, you can actually spend thousands of dollars on wheels that are junk. Um, you really need to go with brands that are trusted, uh, brands that you know um, have a long history in motorsport or you know are, are really taking the time to build the quality in and then not just making it a marketing exercise. Um, the Germans obviously do that well, the Japanese do that well, uh, Americans it's a little tougher. Uh, some of us do it well and some of us don't. So.